my grandparents left from Latvia and went to lion country in what was Rhodesia. And being Latvian and wanting to have style, they had homeschooling for the four children in English and French. Oh, wow. So my mother learned French as a child. Wow. And then she did a lot of talking to us in French when we were growing up. Um, <laughs> Tais toi. <laughs> <laughs> things like that. A lot of songs, a lot of nursery rhymes. And when I came to work with four French women in Toulouse, we were, we'd all learned the same nursery rhymes in our childhood. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yes. Actually, it's funny. My parents, um, they retired a few years ago and they now live between basically Toulouse and Bordeaux. Um, uh -huh. which is a part of France that I didn't know much about, but uh, it's it's a very beautiful region, so. Oh, and Toulouse is just lovely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the food there is absolutely, you know, amazing. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Yes, I, I ate a whole lot of it because we came back and back and back. Yeah. There, of course, we were doing this very big building with four French partners in the making of it. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Very cool. Wow. Mm. Do, do I look nice? It's you look <laughs> great. To look nice. You look yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like also the background, the wallpaper with the. It looks like they're sort of pink flowers, and the green. That's wallpaper carefully chosen for this Art Nouveau house. Oh. And I used to go to New York to decorate his walk and come back with samples, and then Bob and I chose, and we were looking for delicacy with big scale. <laughs> and those little red flowers, if you can see them, mm -hmm. make the repeat very big. But at the same time, the flowers themselves are small, but they're red and you can see them as a big pattern. And then we made this very soft green. We chose the soft green and then we matched the woodwork to that. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. I, I, I live on lockdown here. It's, a, it's my bedroom, but it's also now my workroom. And I have a balcony, and um, I go out. Um, I, you know, I, I broke my femur, and oh. it's still not completely fixed, and it's too cold to go out now. But I go out and exercise on that balcony and dance along there. <laughs> <laughs> you broke your femur. That's a big bone to break. It was very, very sore. Oh, man. And I'm still having training. Yeah. Uh, but we had a student, we always have a student living with us in the summer, an architecture student, to help us do the repair of the house and all the things architects can't find time to do, but other people do them on weekends. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we, we have a, a kid living there, and that's lovely. And the last one he had, um, he, he, was a, he was a fascinating soul, but he sent a letter saying, um, how is it going in architecture now? Well, studio quits are so, so 2020s. And now we have arias from balconies onto patios. <laughs> 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 and that's my way of talking to people without getting COVID, you see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, better safe than sorry. Um, yes. So, uh, so now in, in a more organized way, because... That's just the feeling of what this place is like. This house is incredibly beautiful. And we've been in it since 1972. Wow. And, um, but I, you know, I saw your questions and they're very good. And if you want to start that way, you don't need to know really the story about David Brody and me, although that's <laughs> funny. And I told you that is not necessary. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to cover that. And maybe if we had uh, three days to talk, then it would come <laughs> yes. into play. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, we have we have some questions queued up. It's very conversational, but we generally like to work sort of chronologically. So we'll start off with the basic question of, uh, well, uh, it's a statement actually. So, but you were born mm -hmm. in South Africa. And no, you weren't born no. in South Africa. What? I was born in northern Rhodesia, which is now Z Zambia. Okay. And you see, people make mistakes. They also think I became um, a member of the Turi Scott Brown firm in 1969. And I didn't. Um, I worked with Bob from 1960 onwards. Mm. See, it's easy to kind of miss the meaning of what seems a little thing. 
so you no, know, um, my my mother was born in um, what's called now um, Zimbabwe, and that was southern Rhodesia, and literally in Lion Country, and they lived on a farm there, a big farm, and they were they were Latvians, um, Latvian Jews, and they left because poverty was intense for them, and then their father went out to try to find his fortune in this place where gold was discovered. It was always, it was, New York was called the New York, the, the Gold Medina, because of all the money there. Hmm. But South Africa, although gold was discovered, Southern Africa was called the Wilderness Medina. So they went out there and um, my grandmother came out to meet her future husband and they, and they lived there. And when I say my grandmother had um, been given out for adoption to relatives when her father died of yellow fever a short time after reaching South Africa. It's the fate of many people. And so she was brought up with all the domestic niceties and skills, and she was very skilled. She was also very brilliant. Later she became socialist and political and um, when Russia entered the war, you should have heard her argue with my dad. <laughs> she, because she'd been in Russia to see her relatives, the ones who were killed in, in the Holocaust. Mm. But she, she visited them. And when Russia entered the war, my dad was very right wing and very politically um, involved. Not he wasn't politi politically interested and he mm -hmm. read a lot. And he'd left university dropped out in South Africa and gone north to the Copper Belt and started business there. And that's how he met my mother, whose parents by then were unsuccessfully trying to run a hotel in a place <laughs> called Wana Makuba. And, he, and there were a lot of young men from Latvia. And they called them greeners, which is the word, American word green means you're novice. Mm. But it's also Yiddish, and it means someone who's new to the country. So a lot of young Jewish greeners up in the Copper Belt, as it was called. You see all the little synagogues there. And so they went out there. The British were there as large-scale colonializers and occupiers. Uh -huh. We were carpetbaggers, they call it. And the people who began, like my father, he got a concession to put a little store on a mining, on a mine called Nkana. So I was born in Ankana. People say I was born in Kitwe. There wasn't a Kitwe when I was born. That came <laughs> four years later. Born in Ankana, full of Canadian engineers and American um, technical workers and people like that, and, and then people trying to start little stores. And so my mother dropped out of architecture school. They were very poor, but her, my, my great uncle, Put, said he'd put her through architecture school. And then something happened. I don't quite know what, but my dean of architecture had been in her class. So thrilled to find that I was Phyllis's daughter. <laughs> and he said, um, I remember the time that we were all at the far end of the studio and she was at the blackboard chucking chalk at us in a great fury. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, what did you do to her? He said, I can't remember what we boys did. <laughs> and he became quite quite human when he said all that. Um, but then when I went to architecture school, I thought it was women's work. And I huh. went into the studio. They had great big temporary studios because it was just the end of the war. And 65 of us. And I looked there and said, what are all these men doing? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. So your mother went to architecture school. I, I didn't know that. She, she didn't finish. Right. But she she brought us. I said, look, I became an architect at the age of two. Because at that age, she belonged to that group who are famous for having become disciples of Le Corbusier. Oh. And, um, and there's one called... Um, I keep on forgetting his name, but he was the one who designed our house, and it was built in '34. It was a wonderful modern house. If you know Le Corbusier's um, house 
in um, America that was um, designed for um, a school in England. And um, that, our house looks rather like the, the, the dean's house in that school, huh. which is in Philadelphia. And it's beautiful. And I loved growing up in that house. And did I miss the romance of an attic and the stairway up? Yes, I did. And you know, Bob's house has that, but that's, it leads up to the bedroom, not to the attic. Mm -hmm. And um, it leads up with a little Italian hill town. So ours led up with a, st with a spiral stair. And um, also we could get on the roof and play there. What a privilege. So, and I remember at two, we went to the site and the house wasn't there. And I had plans. And I remember blueprints with white lines. <laughs> And then at the top left-hand corner, I'm two. And I look out and I say, that's a matchbox. Well, it wasn't a matchbox. It was a little rectangle showing a detail from part of that upstairs plan. <laughs> so I, take, I entitle myself to say I was involved in architecture since then. And my mother, sure as anything, brought all the thing about home education we, we went to school, but also she, there were books of all sorts, but a lot of early impressionists and post-impressionists and pencil point books, which is what progressive architecture became later, and all surrounding me that, and also going not only to art class in school, but also to art class um, in town on Saturdays, where, now you see, I grew up surrounded by people seeing the, the, first, the Second World War, and many of them were Jewish, many of them were not. And one person was on his way from China to go and study architecture in America, and war was declared, and they docked, docked, docked on their way in South Africa. And he, that's where he grew up, and he went to my university, and he became my dad's architect, and so now he's families in New Zealand, Mr. Tong, Mr. Tong, Mr. Tung. And um, so there were Swedish people, Dutch people. I had music teachers of all kind for whom it was a way of earning a living because they couldn't get um, reciprocity in medicine, engineering, whatever. So they got, they helped in the physics lab when I was in architecture school, a little man called Dr. Kuschlik. And um, they, they gave us physics. And we girls, during the war, you couldn't get science teachers, at least not for girls' schools, but for boys' schools, just you could. Hmm. And then here was this little old man helping. Then they put us. So we didn't have any help because we put girls together in partnership during the experiments and boys together, not girls and boys. They thought they wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And so there I was, a little girl called Cassie, Kathy Furman, and her dad was an architect, and my mom had studied architecture, so we were together. And then they would, we had to do a, 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 a what's it called when you have a machine, a to, an eternal movement machine, mm -hmm. simulate one. Mm -hmm. So you hooked it up to a faucet and to a tube, and then a set of steps in between, and there it is, and the thing's doing what it should do, fill up, empty, fill up, empty, and it's all set up. We say, Mr. Kushnik, will you come and test it? And I have a merry little man with gray hair. That's what the <laughs> German professors were like. And if you're from, from Berlin, they had great senses of humor. And they'd say different things. One of the ones that came on my most loved teachers. But here was Mr. Kushnik, and he, he says, um, Yes, you have done this, and you have done this, and you have put it all together. Perfect. And when you open that faucet, it will explode. <laughs> <laughs> and did it? We didn't try. We just burst out laughing. With him. <laughs> but the point is, I had that kind of... Manfred Marcus, Marcus was our structural engineer. and But when I met with some Germans as I was traveling by, by chance. And then they said, we'd love to show you Bonn. And I said, no. Um, 
But then I said yes, and and they did. And he said they missed two years of education. He said, in terms of education, we are self-made men, he said. And they were then starting university. And um, so and I didn't talk about not talking to any Germans at all, because you know, all my family were killed by them. Yeah. So, but then later I got a note saying, can we be pen pals? Yeah. And I wrote back saying, I have nothing to say to you as a Jew. <laughs> and um, I got a 30 page letter back. How could we Germans who had Beethoven and Bach, how could we have done this? And do you know what happened in, in my life? And all? I found that their experience as little children, nine when the war ended, and one of them had to be in the apartment alone. His father was an air raid warden. His parents, his mother had taken the younger sister to escape to the country. So he sat through the bombing alone, nine. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, he picked his way through all the bodies to school. Jeez. And um, the other one had to go out on his bicycle to look for food for the family and came back with one potato. That's all he could find. And he knew about being hungry. Yeah. And I didn't find that when I was at the AA and I talked with my English friends about it. So all of these were pieces of my experience. And then I went back to South Africa on leave and, and I had gone to talk with Manfred, um, why am I forgetting his name? Um, he was my my structure director. I can't remember more than two proper names at one time because I'm 91. <laughs> That's but anyway, fair. So, so I, I went, I, when I got back, I went back into that studio, but I'd gone to him when I didn't understand something about structures. And, and you, and particularly if you were a pretty young lady, it seemed. And I, another friend of mine told that as he would do this. So I went with my sandwich and I sat with him. His office was walking distance from our studio. And we had lunch together. And um, he showed me the thing that worried me. Then I went on and I said, um, and I'm 17, you see. I have a need for structure in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was because of studio. Um, they were all pulling on the sort of superiority thing and you just say, oh, no, it's quite wrong what you've done there. Can they explain it? Well, it's the thing of aesthetics. How do you explain it? It's just wrong. Um, I finally worked out. I had not made it look like a 1935 modern building, which is, although he didn't say so, that's what Professor Fassler wanted, my the old friend of my mother. Mm -hmm. and it was very suppressing for students to find the no good thing that you've as I can tell you about it, and you've done it wrong. Yeah, yeah. So that's what made me leave South Africa. I had to find something more reasoned than that. Huh. But the younger people who ran the first studio, they were also, one was an English, of English, English Jewish origin, and the other was um, of, of Belgian. He'd been, they'd been um, diamond merchants, you see, and he oh. was probably very rich. He built a big house in Johannesburg. He's a, very short young man, and they taught beautifully, and they ran um, research studios. That's how I began to know how to run learning from Las Vegas from them. Really? Yes, and you see, when people ask me, what did you learn? They always say, well, I presume you had to leave South Africa, and then you started to learn. Well, I had to dis dis you know, disappear from um, Professor Fassler's telling me, it's all wrong, but he can't tell me why. <laughs> I had to sure. disappear from that. But when someone said, How? I'm sure you learned pop art by going and visiting the Smithsons. Mm. I said, absolutely, I learned pop art in Africa. Huh. And he was amazed and then excited. He said, this hasn't been written about yet. You must tell me about that. And But that's the truth. With well, the way my grandmother made do and um, built herself a dressing table, you know, which means the one you put your makeup on mm. at, making it out of two paraffin cans and some cotton fabric that you could buy in the stores there. Oh, and wow. you see, we were carpet baggers, we were storekeepers, and then we could also see all the fantastic things you could buy in other stores. The whole of Manchester landed up in the colonies, you see. So you could you could trace all of that and you could trace the beads coming over you know, from Phoenician times all the way through Africa. 
ending up right outside Johannesburg. You could find closed deposits of beads there. And what Africans were doing with beads were, were amazing because they used them in traditional ways and they built their houses in traditional ways. Then they started looking at the houses around them and started building in, in the ways English people built houses, not round anymore, but square and all of that. So it's a wonderful set of, of um, possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so, and also um, Robert Scott Brown's parents owned the farm and Africans lived on their farm, built their cars there on their land, whose land, you know, they, they had bought it or, or stole it from Africans, and then, but they lived there in crowds, and then they began making front porches and little square houses hmm. because they wanted to look for like the house the boss lived in. Do you think that, and, I mean, it seems like your, your upbringing, those experiences are very much mm -hmm. tied to um, a middle class or lower middle class, however you would describe it, um, type of life. Uh, do you think that if you had grown up, let's say, in a very, very wealthy family, that uh, you would not have gained those same experiences? Exposure well, to... Well, let me put it this way. My, my grandparents were poverty-stricken. Okay. Um, my father, being somewhat dyslexic, dyslexic mm -hmm. and one of seven, um, he wanted to get a loan from the bank in Johannesburg, and they say not for Jewish men. And his father said, you don't want to do that. So my father said, look, there's gold and copper discovered in northern Rhodesia. I'll go there. And he built a little mine, a non-mine compound. He was, had permission. He found a drunken Scotsman who wanted to sell the concession. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Scotsmen came and they were accountants and different things. And when I want to teach the economics of urban development, I say to people, where do you think my grandmother could have bought pickled herring in Rhodesia at that time? Not in Lyme country, where did, she, where did she go? I said, she would have found a store owned by Lebanese in Bulawayo and they had imported the pickled herring. So we were the people who built the economic superstructure not the army, not the military supervision, mm. not the you know, not the culture, and they were not rich, but my dad became pretty rich, hmm. and so you know, and he could afford to send me to America, and I didn't have to get a scholarship, but I, my university was very very political. Litz University is famous for that, and the great fighters. Arthur Goldrich was my friend, and there was a time when um, he was part of the Ravonia group, and they were all arrested, and his lawyer uncle bribed a guard, and he got out dressed as a nun, but <laughs> while he'd been visiting in Philadelphia, I introduced him to Lou Kahn, and Arthur was as happy and lighthearted. He used to come excavating with us, because I was also a paleontologist at that time, living in, in leopard country. And so I'm looking for um, ancient humans, you see. And I have a whole career in that, too. So Arthur came there. Arthur had been in La Palma, and Colonel Wingate, who was the famous leader of the Jewish terrorist organization, taught them all to make bombs. <laughs> now, Arthur was in the Ravonia group helping the ANC learn to make bombs. But he, he was also son of rich people. Uh, they owned a firm called Greatermans, and he used to also design stage sets. He was studying architecture. <laughs> um, he spoke Hebrew fluently, and he wrote it fluently. And he was designing stage sets and all of that, and they came and arrested him. Then he escaped dressed as a nun. The next thing, Lou Kahn saw all the headlines of a guy he's just met. <laughs> Goldrich escapes to Israel. <laughs> and so, and then uh, another friend was also like that. He was head of a student rationalist society. This was far more left wing than, um, say, Penn, or even the social planners at Penn, who were the people I really liked teaching. And and I had great arguments my, with my dad. You see, um, the Africans 
could go to Penn's, or to, to Witz, Witz, Witz Wartes Rund University, we call it Witz, I am a Witzy, okay. as well as a, from Penn. Okay. And um, I still have friends there. But um, so the, the Witz um, students, learning that they were going to close permission for Africans to come and study at the medical school, the school at Witz, they said, we know there's no place which teaches black. They said, as long as there's no school for blacks, apartheid will allow them to go to a white school, which was lit. Mm. And um, when, the, when, the, uh, when the Afrikaners, when the nationalists got really involved, they said, that ends. Just no more medical education for black people. Then no, no government paid education for whites. For, for black people at this. So the students to get, to get, got together and by a majority voted enthusiastically to up their own fees to continue it. I haven't heard that from any American university. <laughs> uh, n- no, uh, students have yeah. volunteered to up their own fees. Uh, that's, I don't think that's going to happen, in part because but, the fees are astronomical. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, you see, the fees in South Africa weren't that astronomical. Mm. And because it was a lot of it government paid for. Mm. But um, but then I had a huge, huge argument with my dad. (laughs) And he said, you shouldn't vote for that. Now, he was very right wing, but he was also great hearted and generous. And we'd go to a place which was full of black people and white people and Afrikaners and all of that. Um, and there, there was still the, the zoo and the zoo lake, it was called, big public area in a northern area with there lots of Africans working. And the donor said it's on condition, it was always kept integrated. So it was. And um, we used to sing the singing at night, so all the people used to go there together on Sundays. And it was so, so it's sentimental, that singing. Beautiful. But anyway, so he said, Think of it this way. A black kid has been at bits and being given everything open to him, and then he comes out into the real world, and it's too cruel. And I said, yes, it's very cruel, and it's a very bad problem, but they have, if they don't go, one worse problem. And he said, what? I said, no education. And he got very mad at me. You're such a cynic, he said. We were, we were eating strangely in a Chinese restaurant in London. When we were doing okay. all this. Was it and Christmas? We began, shouting. <laughs> we began shouting in that restaurant. Oh, gosh. And, and when we didn't talk to each other. And he was, at that time, 1953 it was. So he was um, in his late 40s, early 50s. And um, 1980, he suddenly said to me, I agree now. Wow. What do you agree about? Don't you remember? <laughs> no, I don't remember. Don't you remember you said it would be too hard a problem, and I said it wouldn't be. Now I think you're right. And I felt very, very mixed feelings. First of all, he left my mom, and he found a new companion. And she, she was good. It was a good thing. And, mm. you know, it, 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 a tragedy for my mother, and sure, she woke up and thought she was having more fun. But anyway, so... <laughs> But what has happened is Wendy had influenced him, and but much more not having to be in South Africa. I said, it's all very well to vote that way if you can afford it, but what about when you couldn't afford it? Why didn't you vote uh, that way? Right. Well, I wasn't voting that way either. I was, t- and then I had another friend called Joel Carlson, and he was the student, the Rationalist Society president. They used to go and ask architecture students in the studios nearby, can you do a poster for my student meeting? So we were all used to doing posters for various left-wing student things, and I did one for him. And then we became friends. And then he said, look, I'm afraid with my political life, it would not be safe for you. Because he's, he, was the, became, he became a lawyer, and he became the lawyer to the people who were on trial for treason. And you see, when I said I was too afraid to join those movements, I was 17 and 18. And not only that, people being threatened with execution for having been in those things. You know, 
people who were professors at the university and with good training. And or, you, know, you went to their houses, you, they'd be um, decorated in an upper class way. And whereas a left wing sociological professor at Penn might have Mexican and other craft um, ornaments in their house and not much else, and maybe some of the, the French impressionists, something like that. Um, these people had beads of all sorts from all sorts of African ways of using beads, which were magnificent. And, and that's what started getting me into pop art when I found Africans, I um, <clears throat> they didn't only cover gourds with beads, which they did, and we had some. But I've got a, here at home a Coca-Cola bottle covered with African beads. And the messages on the beads are all the ones that have all, always been there, little square things like little billboards. And yellow meant, I hope to see you soon. Blue meant missing you. They were all little love messages. And that's where I say they went from you know, uh, Zulu folklore to Zulu pop art. Interesting. And, and making violins out of the paraffin cans my um my grandmother had used for for um in her era for, for dressing tables and also um making shoes which we called scatu and they were made out of um the the, the tar the, the rubber of um of big wheels heavy wheels mm -hmm. and then the straps made of the inner tubes and um Lots of Zulus wore those. They were very soft for walking and bad territory. Mm -hmm. And there lots of white people bought those too. And then Afrikaners made um, felskun, which means um, skin shoes out of cowhides. And then they put rubber on those. And I use those for walking in the felt. So all of these were ad adaptations made to an African situation. Yep. That's why I say that. Well, that's incredible. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned paleontology. Do you think that your experience in that field impacted how you thought about or approached the architecture and urban work that you did? Yes, but um, indirectly. You see, because we didn't have science all the way through high school to the last two years, and then because what they could find was biology teachers. I had biology every day in high school for two years uh -huh. to catch up. Still got a D in the matric exam. But that's <laughs> because because the, but the, the way of teaching it in South Africa and the English teacher who told me. But what she taught us was I learned how to make plans and sections. I learned how to label plans and sections. Um, I learned how to do diagrams of systems the digestive system, the reproduction system, the eye, all of those things I learned in biology, and I learned them very hard. Mm. Um, so that was very useful when I began thinking of mapping and uh, uh, also making plans where you could see how bricks were cut, because I showed you how petals were cut in a, in a rose mm. <laughs> when you made a plan of it. So I could handle that sort of thing. Um, also, I'd fallen in with architects, and um, one of them, he and I were the same age, but he'd gone straight on to university, and I'd gone to university, but I'd done the things I didn't want to stop studying just yet. So I almost took the equivalent of, a, of an English, or of a college degree in America. I studied, um, I studied physics because it was a good idea to get rid of it, and math for the same reason. Right. But I also studied more French, more psychology, and more, um, and, and also um, I didn't study the French, psychology, and English. Wow, those are the ones. And when and I, I, I goofed off. I deserved to goof off. I'd worked so hard. <laughs> you know, in Japan, they call them unmarried aristocrats. Kids after high school, they're allowed to go crazy and mad before they settle down again. So whenever anyone says to me, how could you possibly have heard of the such and such? How, how could you know that? I go back to that year where I didn't supposedly learn. How did you understand the vague, vague and effectiveness? 
Fechner process. Well, you learn that in psychology, but there's a folk song about it. When you drop a frog into a bucket and you and you um, boil it up, it doesn't jump out because it doesn't see the difference between. Right. That's the law of Vega Fechner effect. <laughs> um, but I, but and then you see, I later became very friendly at um, UCLA, actually at, at Penn first, and then at UCLA was a professor of um, ethnomusicology, and he became one of my very close friends, and he was about, um, I was 35, and he was going on 70. Wow. Wow. And um, <clears throat> he knew that folk song, because he's documented all those folk songs, and he invented a computer um, uh, to document songs without passing it through a human being to recognize the systems of the songs so that when her name was Laura Barclay, lost all her labels for the songs she'd. And I'd known about um, this, you know, making recordings of songs in Africa by Hugh Tracy. I'd been to a lecture by him. But Laura Barclay was my friend's chief competitor, and she got a lot of money to do it, and then she lost all the labeling. So we invented a melograph, it's called, to recognize the ones you couldn't identify as a human being. And so, but what happened was, I was trying to now talk about determinants of urban form. And Dave Crane introduced me to that way of thinking. Um, and what it means is, um, Le Corbusier invented view ideas, and a hundred years ago, just more now, and so he knew about the rooftop, and he knew about access, and he knew about um, a lot of glass for health. And people forget it was for for um, for what it, it was for slum clearance and the problem about illness, as much as it was for architectural style mm -hmm. when they did that. Mm -hmm. People have forgotten that. But so um, I was trying to find a way. We They, they pointed out that um, the things Le Corbusier said after that don't make sense. He didn't know how to bring cities together. You could uh, go read Joseph Frank. He can tell you how if you go into any medieval town, you will recognize the this and the that and the other. Le Corbusier didn't look hard enough at all of that. Hmm. He, he did catch on. He, he wrote about donkeys, and he called donkeys as the, um, the, the developer of the, of the European city. And he said, look, when the street is straight, the mind is clear. And look at how the donkeys go in circles. So the donkeys are stupid, and they, look, they design stupid cities. Um, <laughs> And then I look into it and I say, I've seen an awful lot of donkey paths coming from Africa, i tell you that, and walked lots and lots of donkey paths, more than he has. <laughs> and they will go around to find a tree, they will find a, a, they go around because of a log, and particularly where there's a, st a spur, they will have to go around at the speed that they can on that hill, carrying a cord of wood. And I've got photographs of Africans doing the same thing. They're carrying the wood, and the, the slope in the, in the street is just enough to let it go up and round and round the spur and round the other side. And so coming up the middle of the spurs in Siena is um, farmland, and they can go right up to the marketplace with a little bit of help from the donkeys going round in contours. So I say, it's the donkey who's the functionalist. And Le Corbusier is an ass. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now I've got people into understanding, believe it or not, central place theory. Mm. But I also studied with Walter Isaac, a famous man for going into regional science and the space economy. And I took two courses in that field and became a good friend of Walter. And um, I, I went to his classes, and he was so good because the thing is terribly computerized. Mm. 
And try as I, 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 I audited a course in computers. And, but they, I, I found them. He started off by saying, you see, any act was invented at pen. So he starts off by saying, um, a, a large size computer is very big. It would half fill a medium sized room. Now, I've been taking hacking from people like Paul Davidoff, who's my dear friend, another dear friend, like Charles. And he, so he, I say, you say that architects deal only with intuition, and you're completely wrong. I finally managed to educate Paul. And by the way, there's an article in my present book uh, written by um, one of my students in planning about the differences between Paul Davidoff and me. Mm. And Paul Davidoff was a great idealist, and I shared his ideals and you know, about about, um, about uh, um, advocacy planning and um, selling your your services to poor people to represent them on a planning team. And the amount of money you cho- you you pay them is nothing. You do it as a volunteer, but you are their advocate in that planning team. And I've done that work quite a lot. Mm. Um, I wish also some of the other people who say I didn't do anything for Africans would start looking more. But, but anyway, so it, the point is I, I'm now using that. I'm getting students familiar with the notion that they're going to have to, in a partial way, understand about computers. And there was this wonderful French um, uh, engineer called Robert Le Ricolet. <laughs> And um, he came to Penn and he said, we live in a partial knowledge society and architects are going to have to understand about computers without understanding altogether how they work. And this is not only for structures, it's for understanding the patterns that the forces in society make in the form. And you have to be able to read maps to understand how this is done, usually in, by the transport system. Mm-hmm. Now, look, the transport system with all this, with all this traffic models, forget that. First of all, start with a donkey. Okay. <laughs> and start by crossing your fingers and looking at two busy roadways. Okay, now where are you going to put the skyscraper? Obviously in the middle. Where will you put the shops? Further along out. Where will you put the houses, the suburban houses, way out? That central place theory is awfully simple. Mm. And, and I had a lecture I gave in Mexico City, and I saw all the students there, they were really young students, and their fa- faculty were walking out with their fingers crossed. <laughs> so that's the way I have to teach these things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay, now have I had said enough about all of that? <laughs> <laughs> we're just starting. I think you covered a lot. I mean, I, I have yes. to say, um, as a brief commentary, your memory is is like impeccable and really impressive. Yes, except I have mine. to remember um, uh, that yeah, I, it, it's hard for me to remember some names. Ah, well. And if I've got three or four names, you know what I do? I go to Siri and I see what she can do. Um, <laughs> and then I, I also um, I start associating. And at this, I've got a friend who's also losing his memory. Mm. And we kind of, I say, look, we well, both of us, we couldn't think of Maurice Chevalier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so he was talking, and I say, look, while you're talking, I think just before you find it, I may find it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very psychological. And sure enough, he went on, and he said, it's this, it's this, and it's Sunday Maurice Chevalier. <laughs> Where did it come from? It hopped into my brain. <clears throat> I just need a little bit of competition, and, that's all. Yes, and then I have, I always need helping me, some with an English degree, because they're much better at writing proposals for, which catch the enthusiasm of the proposed cloud. You have to write mm-hmm. in a way that they will get, and marketers can't do that, but people who study poetry can. Oh, so that's interesting. The latest person I've hired, she said, I guess I'm the first, the first poetry major that you've hired. I said, no, you're the third. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I did want to ask you about the, well, so you went to UPenn, 
What was it like? And before that, you were at the AA in London, right? And so, then before that, at Ritz. Uh, right. So what was the now, transition? Can I just say one thing? Yeah, yeah. I think of my career as long, low arcs. When Bob and I were having so much trouble, and Gordon Bunshaw made us lose one of our jobs, now um, the, the developers in London are making us lose the National Gallery. It's going to be changed beyond belief. Yeah, we need and to talk about that. I, yes, I must talk about that. As it makes you cry. Mm. But when we were crying at all this, I said, look, we have long, low arcs in our career. We just have to be very patient. So my first long, low arc was Africa. And when I said I, I couldn't, I was scared of staying in Africa, not only because I couldn't afford to get into prison and get executed, um, but but also because um, there, there was a situation where um, my dad was a developer and there, were, there was a man who offered me a job and he said, I've, I've hired four of your, your friends from your class and I've given them this much, so I'll give you one pound a month more. And oh. I said, I cannot do that. I didn't say I couldn't work for him. In fact, I did work for him. But I said, I, I can't. And the people who were there, they were very nice. Mm -hmm. One was a communist and so on. But, but, but the point is, I realized I'd better go somewhere where I wasn't known. I'd be much safer in finding my own way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what I did as a result of that? Um, I'm sorry for all these anecdotes, but they're very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Did I tell you this one before? Um, when I was in Mexico City, and I started by telling them that story. They were all very young, and I said, they're all going to be feeling lost in this way. And um, I told them the story of Manfred Marcus, my spy. See, I, mean, I remember his name. <laughs> Manfred Marcus, the, the, the one who... Um, who I, I also went back to him when I, from the AA. He'd, he'd helped me because I said, look, I, need, I have a need for structure in my life. Right. And he was very respectful. He didn't laugh or anything like that. He said, look, I was only 17. And he said, just be patient. Mm. And by the way, I've learned something. I do not need structure in my life. I need to be so enthusiastic about what I'm doing that I, I know what to do. You have to fall <laughs> in love with your project. <laughs> There's more than structure in your life. But anyway, so he said, just be patient, just be patient. And then I said to him, and I have another problem. Said, <laughs> What's that? I can't like Brahms. <laughs> and, 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 and I look distressed, and again, he doesn't laugh. And um, he, he did that because the people who got on with him and he liked him, many of the ones who were interested in structures, but he liked me very much. So I got invited to parties for students at his house. And then we'd have a great time and very merry. And that's the way German professors are. They initiate you into, into the profession by doing that. Huh. Um, I, I got to Los Angeles and I met a, a Swedish professor there of psychology and, and Marie Rahm, who was the first child psychologist in Los Angeles. And they sat there laughing away and telling stories about his patients and her patients. <laughs> there was only a, a, a thin wall between them. And um, when he listened, he could always, she, uh, she listened, she could, no, he listened to her and he could always hear, hear her patients laughing. And she listened to him and all his patients did was cry. <laughs> and they, they laughed away over this. Well, that affinity and camaraderie, which is what brings you into the profession, they could do. But then I went to, um, as I told you, I went to Germany and I made friends with these two German mm -hmm. students. And I liked them very much. And all their stories, they were walking through one story. I found an old life magazine. And in 1941, and I was 1952 there. Yeah. And um, so, there was the war to all end all wars, the war for freedom. And I said, look, Kurt, you can see what we were fighting for. And he looked at me with exasperation and he said, you think our magazines didn't say the same thing? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, then I finally said to him, what made you change? Because an, an, occupating, an occupying army doesn't make you change. And he said, no. I remembered one of our old teachers. Now we were seven and eight. But he was against Nazism. He was probably German-Jewish. And he said he just disappeared. But when, after the war, I remembered the things he had said to us, and that's what helped me come out. That's incredible. And then I went to Manfred Marcus, and I said, I didn't say anything. I just went into the class, because I'd left. But there I was with my old classmates sitting at the back of the room, see if they'd notice me or not. And what happened was that um, Manfred Marcus suddenly he looked up and said, now he had trouble with his eyes. He'd fallen off a platform once because he hadn't seen it, things like that. So he was having a tough time. But he looked up and he said, welcome to a young lady who shouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> and we all laughed. And then after the class, I went up to him and I told him about my story with, um, with Kurt and Hans Martin, Hans Martin. Hans Martin, of course, and they had written to me saying, we were hitchhiking to join me in Spain, and we had a kilometrical ticket, and we went everywhere third class in Spain, and you couldn't use the toilets, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so the next thing was, um, I, I told him about them. And by the way, they'd also written and said, um, and we've met Len, you'll like Len, he'll be joining us. Len was an American from Colombia. And he had gone to do a kind of a grand tour once he graduated. And he suddenly realized if he, if he cut everything to half and stayed in youth hostels and camped and all of that, he could stay for six months, not three. So he was falling to pieces and his clothes were falling off him. And he was tall above all the people. He loved to go and take photographs of marketplace, marketplaces. He was a photography student. And so we see his tall curly head bobbing through the market and every time he went to fish market or whatever and there he was and there we were talking about Nazism and in Spain they'd see these Germans and they wore their gold their, their iron crosses in the street he says aren't they ashamed no they weren't they say they were German they say come and lunch with us where were they going to lunch at the Falanga club we'd end up on so many Falanga clubs um so with all of that, I told Manfred Marcus, and I said, can I trust my German friends? Were they kidding me? He said, no, you can trust their German friends. And he told me a little story about a phys ed instructor he knew very well. And he was invited to, um, to join the Nazi party. Oh. And, wow. and this guy said, no, of course I wouldn't. I'd never do that. And Manfred said, the moment you have said, I'm so sorry, my bad health prevents me from joining the Nazi party, you'll have to leave the country. There'll be no more life for you here. Hmm. So that's the story. The story about Charles is that he had been studying for 10, 50 year, years, the studying I was doing, how do social forces make architecture? How do social forces make folk art, folk music, and all of that? And he was an authority on ethnomusicology. Mm-hmm. And he had a very famous son. His son's name was Pete Seeger. Oh. And um, so, and so Charles and I used to, I have dinner one week at his house, he'd come have dinner at my house. Um, his various grandchildren were there sometimes, and once or twice Pete was there. Um, I had heard Charles give a very interesting lecture, you see, on folk music, when he was in the folk music department at Penn one summer. Mm-hmm. And I knew no one would be entertaining him, they were very unfriendly. So, But Charles was a Boston Brahmin, so he was a little bit surprised when this young woman called him and said, can I take you to lunch? <laughs> and um, and to lunch, Charles, age 70, was still a great ladies' man, and he couldn't <laughs> understand how this was really a pedagogy for me, and 
studying, and it really wasn't talking about having sex. <laughs> but what we talked about was very valuable to both of us, and he then began including my thinking in his work. And then Pete was not as interesting, but he was a wonderful singer and really nice. I had to talk to him about how Charles was worried because he was wondering whether he would have enough money to, to and Charles said, look, don't worry, I'll take care of all of that. And then suddenly Charles's daughter was arrested in Mexico City. There was a conference there, a, 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 a sports conference, and they went out arresting all the people who could cause, cause trouble. And his daughter was in no way about to cause trouble, but she got arrested. Meanwhile, Pete was very interested in the work I was doing, especially when I told him we were studying Levittown. And he said, well, how is it if you say, you know, all of these things about Levittown um, are good, how is it everyone bought ticky-tacky boxes? And I said, no, not everyone bought ticky-tacky boxes. Teenagers did. And that's because they can't get anywhere when they live, live in Levittown. Hey, what is but a ticky-taxi uh, box? He has a song. It's one of his most fa a famous songs about ticky-taxi boxes. <laughs> in other words, it's about people living in Levittown. Mm. And he's very scornful of it and how it's terrible and all of that. And I said, the people who are buying your records are the ones who, who feel caught in Levittown because they still can't drive. But the mothers who can go out, have the kids living in a place where there's green land and still go out and do shopping and all of that, they love it. Hmm. So he listened very hard. And I said, what about studio? I said, it's where you learn your ideals and it's where you learn how to put things together. And then and I asked him how his daughter was doing in studio. She said, um, no, how his daughter was doing in prison because they put her in prison. He said, you know, it's like her studio because she's in prison with the daughters of all the socialist leaders in Mexico. <laughs> and she's learning a whole lot. You could call okay. it her studio. Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and um, so, um, was this... And then the other thing is Charles said to me, when he was a young man, he saw all these beautiful women around and then he saw the older woman. He said, they'll never get like that. And then he said, you know what? They all did. Okay. And, okay. and then he said to me, because I'd been his friend from then, and then Jimmy was by that time five years old, so it was 1976, 77, something like that. And he said, um, you, you are now the oldest of my women. <laughs> of his women. <laughs> <laughs> He's had 10 women, I'm sure. And probably the younger ones all slept with him. But, but meanwhile, look what he did for me. He took me driving and found me a beautiful upright Steinway, Steinway piano for my cottage in, in California. Lovely piano. He, he but, said, no, don't say you want a piano that looks like a building. Find one that's got very good tone and will be reliable. Then I used to open the door of my cottage and play music and people came sit on my porch. Now I can't play music in, even anymore. Well. But um, they had a fire at Jimmy's school here in Chestnut Hill and all the pianos were burned. So I Whoa. called them and said, look, if you'll take care of my piano and make sure you, you give it good treatment, have it because at least you can start again with a piano and they were so grateful. Mm. So I lost my piano to a good cause. And meanwhile, Charles died mm -hmm. and that was a great loss to me too. Uh, Charles, you met at, at, this was in California, you said? No, you see, I called Charles when he came to spend the summer teaching in the folklore department at Penn. Mm. And I knew that people were not being nice and inviting art in art or anything like that. I see. It's a very lonely life in your pen. Uh, I what, knew that because I'd been through that. I was going to ask you, what was your experience at Penn like and what prompted you to go there? But, well, you see, um, Robert Scott Brown and I, and you should tell, what's the person who teaches at um, Penn who just wrote the thing about South Street, and then she said, but Denise's reputation is not is for not having done enough for Africa. And she's wrong. 
there's a problem of trying to work for black causes now. They want to give them all to black architects, and the black architects want to work for black architects, and yeah. you just cannot get the jobs. Uh-huh. And so, but she, so she she wrote that about me. I didn't do enough. She doesn't know all I have done. Um, mm. But but the point was that um, um, Robert Scott Brown and I were very very involved with South African problems, but we were too young to enter all that just yet, mm-hmm. and so. I started at this, but then at a certain point, I decided I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing or why, all of that. I'm going to transfer and go to London. But I'm going to, no, I didn't say it. I said, I'm going to go to London and get a job here. People in my year had to spend that year as an, an a, 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 what's it called, an in, internship? Intern, yes. You had a year of internship, and you, you could go to thought to you go to the the, um, the, the AA. Gre- to you know, well, you could go to Greece and um, oh. and Rome and study classical architecture, and that traditionally is what they did in the internship. But then after the war, you could also get a job, not in South Africa, but somewhere else. Sure. So I decided I'd go and get a job. I wasn't going to. I was going to go back to Robert. I, I was in love with him. Mm-hmm. He was my boyfriend. And um, so I went to um, London, and I got myself a job with Frederick Gibbon. And then I started going around and looking at things. And I was I was doing study travel, if there ever was. And my friends at the AA said, the difference between you, you and the rest of us, we're all studying architecture. You're studying architecture and being a tourist. <laughs> and I'd love to... to That's a great way to study bus. architecture. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, used, I loved to, to take a bus, and it was Tuppence. And that took me to Trafalgar Square. Mm-hmm. A little bit long, longer, like a shilling, took me way out into the suburbs. I watched all where I went and on the bus. When I got to the bus, there was a movie house that was showing... Um, a Leslie Howard picture or something else I wanted to see. I'd see that and then go back again. And that whole outing would be about um, two shillings. Wow. I don't know what that means, and, but it sounds affordable. <laughs> well, two shillings, a sh- 20 shillings was a pound and a pound was $3. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then when Robert arrived, we did the same thing. And we we go to a fish and chips shop and for nine <laughs> pence buy fish and chips rolled up in newspaper and that would be our supper. <laughs> so we, we enjoyed all of that. And I lived in a marvelous place, a wonderful, wonderful, a reverse square. It didn't have the square on the front with a road in the front. It had the square at the back. Mm. There were very few like that. Hmm. It had been an old racetrack. And I lived in, well, we lived in one room there. Mm-hmm. And um, we were all set up there. And then I got, we got, he got a scholarship to go. He was around with me at the AA. And Peter Smithson took a great liking to Robert and Arthur Korn to him. And we got him to agree to do the scholarship and to stay and then to join me in the tropical school. So we spent a year together in that. And Robert got the best out of the AA as well, and they, so there there we were. And um, and then at the end of that, um, I got a job with Erno Goldfinger. He was the place to go. And he was a monster. You just didn't have to work for him. And so that was another story in itself. But meanwhile, we did, we joined the Morgan Club. Now, that sounds like a public school club, which in English terms, it was, but in England, public school means a government school. Hmm. But the, in England, the, the Morgan Club was, um, the members were all London Cockneys. And so unlike anyone else at the AA, we had a second line of social life and friendship with a whole lot of London Cockneys, and we went camping with them with about 16 Morgans <laughs> and things like that. And that was fascinating, too. So we had all sorts of experiences, including architecture. Mm. And then we left and we set out in our Morgan and we traveled all through Italy in it. Wow. And then 
came back and visited Scotland and went to see Robert's aunt there, said goodbye to our friends, mm -hmm. went back to South Africa and worked a year and a half there. Um, and then we left. But Peter Smithson had, had convinced us, you see, everyone in England studied planning because there was so much bombing to fix. Oh. And the same thing in Europe. So um, Peter Smithson said, the only place you should go is where Lucan is. And I see. The, the planning schools in England are two nuts and bolts. Well, now I believe the London School of Planning could have taught us good things because it taught a lot of social planning. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, when, when I got to America and met with Dave Crane, I found all sorts of interesting things to study about planning. And I was going to both of us, idealistically, we were, of course, going back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the first semester of 1959, and we'd be, we're doing a studio, which was um, the plan, the, the, the land of, um, what was the, the one that, um, that Le Corbusier did in India? Shadia? Yeah. I have no idea. I'm terrible Chandigarh. with this. Chandigarh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, you see, it was the, the land of Chandigarh, but a plan which included mass immigrations of people coming to um, a, 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 a capital town mm. and study the sociology of that immigration and uh, also um, planning. Now, I've learned already we, from the AA, we went right i went right back to south africa and went to look at soweto and went to talk to the people at soweto and all of that and photographed soweto and so uh, because of the inner city housing and because i'd been interested before and i'd also been sort of involved in before but not very strongly but so um straight after that we were all very tired you know you know the word charretting yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, you see, you know it, but English people didn't. Um, <laughs> no one knows that word outside of architects. <laughs> yes. But but meanwhile, we, I worked 65 hours to finish my project. That It was in a team. And so that's how things went. And at the end of that, we were absolutely dead tired. <laughs> and then we went to spend a day with some friends at... Um, was called Center Bridge outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And um, there was an accident. We had this little open car, and the top didn't work anymore. And we were in a Sunday line of traffic. And suddenly a car came bolting out from the side and right into us. And we turned over, and Robert was killed. Oh, my. Oh, my. That's very, very sudden. So then it became a sort of a folk. But I went back, I went to South Africa, and everyone said, look, you were loving what you were doing, you were doing it for a good purpose, go back and finish. Everyone, when I got back, was so very hungry. Mm -hmm. and that helped. But it was very, very sad. But I, I finished I did the next studio, and I got um, very, very high grades for everything. William Wheaton, who was the head of the school, told me I got the, the highest grades of anyone in 10 years, and the school was 10 years old. Wow. Wow. And I, I had to tell the people in, in, at the National Gallery that, because you know what Finaldi is saying about me? She's Robert Venturi's wife, 90 years old. <laughs> okay. okay that's yeah, interesting way that's about me to he describe someone me. yeah it's someone's <laughs> wife sure <laughs> i mean yes. it's one portion <laughs> yes well the point is he's not listening to anything he knows what he wants hmm. uh, i can tell a lot about people you know trump arrived um in paris on a plane and uh, important people from out of and they're out of France and in France, including the premier, rather the prime minister, 
no, not the prime minister, the, the mayor of France was there. She's a woman. Mm. And so Trump talked about one and a half minutes and then he left. And this, she's a little rotund lady. <laughs> I know there's this wonderful school in France where people go to learn to be public administrators. And I suspect she went there. But anyway, she looks up and she says, this man is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> After one and a half minutes, which yeah. is what I felt about Trump. It's the same thing I felt about Finaldi. He is uh, so self-centered, you cannot imagine. Uh, I see. I see. And so we know what he wants to do. He says, oh, no, no, it's so beautiful above. I would never touch that. Look at the photograph he has of himself. He's standing <laughs> against one of the portraits there, and he's looking like this, like this. Lord Nelson, like that. You know. Go look at a portrait of Lord Nelson. He's always got his hand like this, his chin up like this. He's fighting the Battle of Trafalgar, second <laughs> Battle of Trafalgar. And the thing is, it's not the Battle of Trafalgar. He's really a Napoleon. <laughs> so, right, right. And then he says, oh, we would never change the top. It's so perfect. It's so beautiful. I think I noticed that he's already painted it beige and painted the Pietra Serena stone black. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I look at what I say. This. Then he says, oh, but the roof, that's terrible. You want to look at the roof. It's all falling apart. It's been fixed for a bad day. The roof. So you know what he wants to do. He wants to take off that roof and build another floor on top. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> More square footage. <laughs> yes, the same as Trump saying, so much fraud, so much fraud. He means <laughs> I want to start a coup. Right, right. <laughs> right. So, but, but the people at the National Gallery won't believe me. Well, so um, I do want to talk about the National Gallery, mm -hmm. but, but maybe sort of sticking with the story. So you return yes, to Penn. I will. Yes. Um, so I, I was a very, very sad young woman, but what saved me was the teaching. You see, I you got. You being a to, teacher or the te your, your teachers? Well, I'll tell you, ah. <laughs> um, I, I got through the next studio working with Dave Crane, and Dave Crane was a great nurturer for me. He, he had grown up in Nigeria, and he, he just, when, when I first got back, I lived with them for eight weeks, and they just watched over me and helped me, which was a big struggle for them because they weren't well off. Mm. And, um, and so I had to leave, and I, I found a nice place, and then... Um, the support I got was this. I had a lovely room with a lovely view back onto the oil pipes of the refinery. And that, that used to send out light at night. And I'd see yellow on my wall. And I saw all this urbanism in front of me. I loved looking at that. But I'd sit there and cry. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but I had a nice, nice, people helped me make my place very nice to live in. Um, and then um, I, I, there, there was a couple living on the same floor with me. The, the house had been two apartments on, on each floor. And um, I was in the bathroom, and I realized there was a quarter-inch panel between the two of us. So I could hear everything they said in the bathroom. So I sent them a little message saying, you should, you should. So then we became friends, and then they became my great comforters. Uh -huh. And they were um, American Studies students. Huh. And um, they, they sad they later separated. Mm. But meanwhile, they just gave so much. Um, Jeff, Jeffrey's father had committed suicide. Oh. Oh, and so... And Nancy said, Jeffrey, tell, tell Denise how your father died. And so he could share that feeling of sorrow. And, and she, she too, they had a lot. I still phone her once a month. He's dead. He's not dead, are they? Mm. They, they separated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but so there, at least there was someone there like that. And then um, at the next semester, I began teaching because there was, I'd seen a course that the person, who was teaching it was a teaching assistant and he he was going back to new zealand and i said couldn't i take up that course and um so dave crane went to bat for me and got it yes now the dean thought of me as a as a ta whereas i in fact was an instructor and paid as an instructor 
mm. which is as un- underpaid as you can imagine, but <laughs> never is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, and I had the job of teaching this first theories course. Um, Bob talked about his theories course, but it was the second. Mine was um, for, first of all, for, for city planners who were not architects, who had to learn about architecture and something about drawing and mapping and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there was about 12 of them. And that was my first course. And that was, they were all big liberals, big left wing people. And, you know, one of them was called Carla Cohen and her husband was a, a, a what's the word? The, you, you pressurize Democratic Party, a lobbyist for Democrats. Mm-hmm. 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 So he was a lobbyist already for Democrats. She was the daughter of a very successful skin doctor. And she was fun, round and roly poly. But um, <laughs> and she, I also made her in charge of the all, overall team. And they were, they were they were political sciences. And he's I'd given him a project, design a room and construct it in a small model out of card, but make the walls the colors you would need them to be to drive you dippy. Interesting. <laughs> and this kid. He sits there and he's, he, he's so demanding on himself. He has to get the thing of it right and beautifully made. And he sits there saying, but I'm going to be a political scientist. <laughs> Kissing himself and still doing it. You see. <laughs> and I had quite a few like that. I had some whose parents were communists. And, um, and they were very generous huh. and they were very nice. And like the faculty t- took no notice of me. And after a jury and the time is one in the morning and there's no one saying can I walk home with you and two of my students come up can you walk but can we walk you back to your house that's very nice and without them I wouldn't have survived all of that mm-hmm. but I gradually worked my way into it and then you see Paul suggested the notion that there should be a theories course for planning and Holmes Perkins hearing that and seeing what he was talking about he said, we need one for architecture too. Hmm. And this isn't, wasn't the one teaching the planners. Um, mm-hmm. but by the way, um, Carla Cohen was mentioned by Barack Obama because she became the owner of something called Poetry and Prose Bookstore. She mm-hmm. didn't become a planner. A few of them did. Hmm. And so, um, and Obama said, that's the best bookstore in Washington. <laughs> And one of the first things she did was have Bob and me come and give a lecture there <laughs> on learning from Las Vegas studio. And she was running her shop just the way I'd been running the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Forcing patrons and to it, make and models. And <laughs> wondering in the background was that other woman who was in the, um, uh, in the, the, the uh, chief justice, what was her name? Um, she was from Texas and she's very, very right wing. But while we were talking, she was listening in the background. Hmm. Um, and but then also, um, so so Holmes ap- approached Bob and said, "Now, Paul called a theory of planning, and Holmes sophisticatedly said, ours will be called theories of planning." Hmm. So the one I taught to the first semester planners was theories of planning, not theory of planning. Mm-hmm. And you know, theories of architecture. Mm-hmm. And they was both theories of architecture. But what they were doing was they were designing, first of all, his theory was they all had degrees, but they were undergraduate liberal arts degrees. Therefore, they're very well read. Now, you have to have something that trains them how to draw, trains them how to look, mm-hmm. teaches them about the vocabulary of architecture that already exists. Mm-hmm. And he treated me as a TA, but he said, that's what I want you to do. Well, I killed myself doing it just as much as Bob did the next semester. Right. But that's how Bob and, Bob and I met, because um, I, I, you know, I had to give them drawing exercises, but also lectures on 
theory in the seminars, and also um, um, uh, term papers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I, what I did was I got them for one thing to go and well I made a book of all the things and put it together and that's what you find in all my studios. It's got a book that tells you the the theory of it all and it says what I want you to do and when and when there'll be these lectures and etc. So we just work through that. And um, but the first thing they had to do is go and learn about um, urban spaces. And I get, I'm not sure if it was the first thing, but I gave them um, several um, design things. Like I said, one of the design things was, I want you to find an outdoor space, and I stress outdoor space, that mm -hmm. you like, mm -hmm. and then place in it a six by six by six white stone cube. And that's a piece of sculpture. And look at the building around you. I'm not getting them to do any drawing of plans or anything because they couldn't. So I said, go and look at the space and work out why you like it, where you want to put this thing, and then make a plan of the space and show me where you are putting this cube in mm -hmm. the space. And if you don't like the notion that it's all that abstract, imagine it having thin lines on it to make it some form of unobtrusive sculpture. Mm -hmm. And they enjoyed doing that. Then I found whatever I said about um, a, an open space, one of the reasons I did it was before six months had gone by, I, it, it took six months to go by before I had time to go to sightseeing in Philadelphia from the work Dave Crane gave us. So I said, my people are going to start by going and looking in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm on the campus or somewhere else and have a job while they're looking, which is the architecture way. So they, they hmm. did. And um, one of them came back and he put the space indoors. And he was a very bright kid. He wasn't that he was stupid. I said, why did you do this? <laughs> and he said, why did I do this? And he said, because I was so keen on the space and I was wanting to do something about that space that I just didn't notice that underlined word. So then we could talk about psychological set. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um, so I, within half a minute of being in that class, um, I knew I loved teaching. Mm. And I knew I'd been doing it all my life and asked my siblings what they thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't really have any kind of grand plan to become a teacher necessarily. Um, it no, was... I just found my heart was full when it needed to be full. Yep. And my students were kind to me. Um, one day, one of them um, came into the room and he said, um, I'm really a head of a corporation, and, and, but now I'm, I'm being a, a student. But I knew I always get 80%. And you're never going to be a good teacher. You gave me 42%. <laughs> How could that be? You know, you need to fix that. You know? Yeah. So I thought a moment, and I gave them a good fight, all those students. And I said, well, um, I can quite understand what you're saying, and I could, you know, at 42%, I could maybe give you another 2%, but 40-something <laughs> percent, never, never, forget it. He walked out saying, you'll never be a teacher. And I put my head on my desk and cried. No, uh, did you really? <laughs> oh, yes. I was you see, I was so easily able to cry then oh. because of losing yeah. Robert. Yeah. So in came Peggy Wheaton, and she was a, a rambunctious student. She'd gone to Harvard, and she told me she got her liberal arts degree, and very brilliant. And she told me her a trip one day. She said she's hated to see un, untidy um, situations, and I was up somewhere and I needed to go somewhere else and she drove me 300 miles. Wow. So just because she didn't like untidy situations, but in that <laughs> trip she boasted about her life at Harvard and she said she had made um, a compact with herself that she would sleep with all her first year faculty members. <laughs> okay. And she said she had seen, succeeded with all except one. <laughs> 
And that's when she told the story to. <laughs> and, oh <my> <laughs> and, yeah, and then what happened? <laughs> and then she, she did very well and she got um, into transportation planning and she was doing that and working in Washington. And, but she and Bill Wheaton, who had divorced his wife, got together and they married. He was about 25 years older than she was. And then she went with him to California mm -hmm. when he went to be head there. And when, you see, Bill Wheaton had got me a joint appointment at a very early age at Penn, so teaching both planning and architecture. And by the way, I was working an 80-hour a week and um, teaching those two things. Bob got the same amount of money for running just the one course. <laughs> Homes yeah. are terrible about women. Yeah. And then, but, but not only that, although Holmes taught only one course, he took 40 hours a week to plan that course. So he was also working 80 hours a week, uh, Bob. I see, I see. And, and, so, and then I came to the, one of the early faculty meetings. Now, Bob had seen Robert and me, and Lou Kahn had too. Mm -hmm. because they gave a special presentation of our project. And Lou was very jealous of people who threatened him. He sent Bob to work for Siren and said he wouldn't be in, in Philadelphia because <laughs> no, he didn't want him there. <laughs> and we know that Lou told other people, oh, I would never have done something like that, when he was competing with us for a project. Mm -hmm. So it's just sad because Bob loved Lou, and it was a great disappointment to him. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile... Um, so, um, I, where was I? I, I was at one of the first faculty meetings and Holmes Perkins was not there in that faculty meeting. And I was always prepared to talk out. And in fact, one day when I was a student and Lou was doing, uh, a, um, he, he was a, a, a neighborhood unit with his architecture students. And um, I got up the way you would do at the AA. At the AA, had, if you had a friend who was giving a project, you'd go and help support him if he needed it. Mm. And if someone else gave uh, a criticism, um, you'd take on that per person too and say, because you were in the class, and they didn't say you couldn't enter the class. But when I got up, now there's a red head at the back of the room, and I suddenly say, yes, but you know, what Isaacson said about her, about her uh, was not this, he said that, and you really can't listen. And everyone turned around, who is this with this English accent? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Lou Kahn got a strangely triumphant look on his face. It took me about 40 years to realize what that was all about. And what was it about? Um, he had had a girlfriend, and she got she got pregnant, and home sent her back to her husband in Canada. Oh, and she never came back again. But she was hoping very much to come back, and she was redheaded, and she had an English voice. And <laughs> Paul Davidoff had taken theory of architecture with her, which was the course that I was then running said to me, you know, sometimes I think I'm hearing a ghost <laughs> because you're talking about the same stuff and you're talking with the same accent. I said, how could Paul think that she had, she's a Canadian, how can she think <laughs> she had the same accent right. as I? And then I heard her talk one day, I think she did have exactly the same accent. She was another Jewish refugee and had gone to live in England the way wow. Herb Gans had and others spoke with her. Um, it was an English accent. Wow. But then the person who remained was a bitter enemy of mine because I'd removed her friend and I had to deal with Shasha Nowitzki. It was very different for me to mm. do that. And my students all said, why is she so horrible to you? <laughs> and she'd go to the students and she'd say, we understand, don't we? Denise doesn't understand. We understand. Of course you can't, can't do this. And meanwhile, they agreed with me. <laughs> so, so, so Lou Kahn thought hard in my first year. So Lou Kahn thought that you were this other person, his former girlfriend. So not only that, Lou Kahn saw that almost every member of the faculty did that. So I can't say only he. Sure. But um, tried to, to. In other words, 
and even Charles, you see. But there was another one. His name was Gutkin, and he he was Serbian, and he knew my teacher at the AA, who is um, another of my very best friends, um, and he he was a teacher who persuaded um, Bob, no Robert, to stay in the AA, and he he talked to him about the November group, um, Alex Alec Corn, mm. and. And so he he persuaded him to say, I had them for, for um, scones and tea in my apartment in London. And um, Corn, Arthur Corn, and Arthur Corn did for me what he did for Robert, what he did for me. Arthur Corn was always the youngest of these, but the other ones were, and he named all the greats were there. And this was a wonderful time. And Robert was so keen on the early modern movement anyway. So he stayed. And I stayed, and we had this great time together. But um, so, uh, well, Arthur Korn was a wonderful support to me. Oh, yes, that was the other thing. He saw I was falling to pieces. I just said, and said, if only I could see even one person. Now, after a few years operating around that area, I knew lots of people when I walked in the streets. Even at this, uh, at Piccadilly Circus, I'd see people I knew. But... It happened to me once. I was waiting outside Swan and Edgar's at Piccadilly Circus, and Robert used to call that the center of the world. I'm going down to the center of the world. <laughs> and um, suddenly there was a woman in my face. She said, were you snubbing me on purpose? It was one of my mother's most touchy friends in Johannesburg, <laughs> thinking I was snubbing her. But So I did see one person I knew. But otherwise, I felt very sort of, um, stranded in that way. Mm -hmm. But Arthur Korn saw what was happening and he sort of specialized in finding foreign students who were falling to pieces. And he takes them to this little coffee shop called Debris. And he'd sit there on Fridays, we'd have coffee together there. And then um, he would talk to me. In all of this, Arthur Korn did that. And um, you know, <laughs> Le Corbusier did this. And it was, again, it was very just I say supportive. And mm. then in the end, I came back and we had a lovely time when you know, I was married. He was very happy to see me. But he left shortly after because Austria offered pensions to people in his situation. And he could get a lovely place to live without paying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so when you were at, Pence, at UPenn, um, were the classes that you and Bob taught, did those become sort of the foundation or the starting point for the books of like complexity and contradiction and um, <laughs> complexity and contra contradiction architecture and learning Las Vegas? Yes, I know. Hmm. Um, first of all, Bob was in the American Academy of Rome and he didn't hear a word about mannerism there. Not one word, mm -hmm. nor anyone in America. But what happened was that when I was in London with the Smithsons, there was a whole thing about mannerism going on and been going on for nearly 10 years. Oh, and really? so I fell in with that. The Smithsons used to go and look at mannerist houses, and I went with my friends to look at mannerist houses and mannerist churches. And so I got, and I sat through Somerset's lectures twice, and it was so good. That means. There was a year of them, and you sat through the whole thing. And then the next year, it was the same thing. And so Somerson got used to this redhead sitting in the front of the class and asking him questions. And then later, my friend Robin Middleton, who I was at school with, and he went straight to college. It was straight to architecture, and I spent the year uh, doing a uh, liberal arts because I wanted to. And then when I got to England, he followed shortly thereafter, and he got a big scholarship from Pevsner, um to study at Cambridge because he was very brilliant. And um, so there was, and, and Robin met Pevsner, so I met Pevsner and talked with him too. And then my parents invited the Pevsners because they invited me to dinner. And they went and, and we, we went and talked there too. The funny thing was, my dad is able to talk architects and imp impress them 
more than they impressed him, and it was very funny. <laughs> and then my, my friend says, your dad an architect, now you're a developer. Mm-hmm. And, but Persner, who, who fled, you know, but he became a Lutheran. He didn't, he said he wasn't Jewish anymore, but he, he listened all the time to my father talking. He must have had a businessman father, you see. And so there they were talking away about development and business and all of that. I wanted to hear Pepsa talking about architecture. Mm-hmm. But I did meet with him twice, and we did take his book as our study manual. And Robin gave us every single painting and building we should see from London to Venice to Rome um, when we went study traveling. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and I also. Um, you know, it meant I went and looked at an awful lot of um, manners buildings and heard a lot from um, Thomason on them. And so when Robert, when Bob talked to me, first of all, he heard us make this presentation to Lou Kahn, where it was Kahn's basic structure of studio that I accepted there. And I practiced it twice as his student, once as his assistant, and then I did it myself. Hmm. And I had done another couple before Bob and I got together. And then the first one I did with Bob was when we were married and he was teaching at Yale. And I set up one of their studios in my format and wrote all their work programs and things. And that one was on um, the 34th Street station in New York. Oh, yeah. And it was all research. And it was set up to um, relate it to architecture as well. And that's the the nub of our problem now with the National Gallery. Um, We really did a study of how you can create civic space without giving it a 20-foot ceiling. Because if you did that, it would be once only, not through the whole system. Mm. So to find something that could be civic and cordial and safe and able to be built. And I've made six or seven different studies like that of um, mass communication on um, World's Fair shows, um, parts of campuses, um, particularly museum galleries, mass communication on the People Freeway, we called it. And... um, so that's what it comes out of. And, and, the, and the setup was from Dave Crane, and then I, I, I changed it a lot. I broadened it to do things, and I made it more able to relate to architecture as well. Hmm. And then, by the way, if you read this, this book that's come out, it also explains how um, it, it follows Dave Crane, but it, it also, as I say, sets off into different project areas. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Things like when you're having to walk in a dark place or a place where you can't see because at your 15 abreast, which is the National Gallery on a Sunday. I talked to the to our client in the National Gallery. They said, you don't go and see this place on a Sunday, but I do. <laughs> and you can't see over your shoulder. Don't put anything low down. You can't see. Go and look at the Czech Pavilion in this world's fair because... They worked out how to do that. They put all the things to be seen from the ceiling. And that's one of the things we did. And we introduced some other things. As you came down places where you're in a big crowd, you saw things above shoulder height for those reasons. Hmm. And so all that came in it. But then Bob came up to me after when I had made a great plea because, you see, I had seen buildings by Townsend and people like that, which were Victorian buildings, which had not been changed, but been reused with talent. And here they were talking about taking down the furnace building, um, which was the library. And they said, we have to demolish this. And the dean agreed, you have to demolish that, of course. And I (laughs) began began, um, shouting for um, not doing that. But meanwhile, Bob and Lou had heard Bob making the case for what's called central place theory, um, which Lou Kahn had persuaded Robert to do mm-hmm. um, in the 
in 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 the Las Vegas, no, in the um, the, the, the Indian studio. Um, he had given an explanation of how in a new city, the different kinds of the railway and the road and the people would need different kinds of streets and how these could interchange and how they could build the city. And one night, a student who had been at Harvard in architecture and had also been a painting student had given up both and had gone to the space economy. Now he's an artistic person. He was a good friend of ours. And he and Robert sat till three in one morning. He taught Robert the whole of regional science. And Robert the next day diagrammed it all. And Lou, and I knew these things because I'd take a transportation course. And Bob Mitchell, who was head of the planning office in, in the planning department at Penn, he had described the different kinds of roads and how they were used. And then Lou Kahn had been on that same committee. That's why Lou knew more about how an architect did about them. Hmm. And he had made it into waterways. And there's that famous thing by Lou where you get canals and um, uh, uh, harbors and docks and all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Those were the, 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 the categories of movement, movement of Robert Mitchell. I went to Mitchell and I said to him, Bob, did you do this? And he wouldn't admit to it, but I knew because I'd had his course. <laughs> and he said, maybe, maybe, it was, maybe, it was, maybe it was indeed Lou who did that, but he knew it wasn't. <laughs> okay. And so, <clears throat> then, so then Lou heard that, and he began, as they say, talking about it in that way. But he then stopped that, that and um, he, he started using it in campus planning. So he talked about um, the kinds of spaces that you needed on campus for pedestrians, pedestrian streetways of different kinds. And, and one of them was that there's never enough room for the common room to use access corridors as common rooms. And then the first thing I did when I got into Bob's office was do one like that. It was the one of the buildings at... Um, New York University, where we had, and, mm -hmm. and and so you will see, it's got a long corridor that's treated like a street, and at the bottom, it turns around, so the first steps, as you go up, you provide a sitting place near where they're having the big lecture halls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so I'm the one who brings that kind of thinking into most of our plans. I see. So I, it, so I can say that in our office, we have um, <coughs> one party which starts with what's around and works in. And very often, it's the basic one which gives you, because of the access roads coming in, becoming then the main access in the campus as well, it gives you the basic structure of the buildings and the streets and even their height. But then the next thing is, there comes a time when you have with all of that, you have kind of like the Baroque scale of a campo and an axis and a, a, you know, a medieval street and how they all come together around that main street. And you can read Joseph Frank. He describes how every medieval town is like it. Mm -hmm. So Bob takes something that could be a medieval even ta evil town or, or the bar Baroque part of a, of a Renaissance town and gets these spaces into really architectural spaces. And then you go from there into what we've already settled on the first one about the, the offices will be on this side, the entries to the, 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 um, the, the in French, in English, where I get it, anything. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the entries? The, 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 the Conseil General. There yeah, I got it in French. The Conseil, Conseil General. The, people, <laughs> the, the deputy. So the deputies, the, the, the representatives, there you have it. To, to get them in, they've used something as an outside street system that becomes a pedestrian street system, becomes a major corridor street system, and then goes to these buildings. And then Bob makes them, and I help make them. Like we both decided that the circus, half circus in the one, has to be like the um, royal circus 
in Oxford. We both love that, mm -hmm. and we make it like a the mannerism of it is a how it attaches at the back in ways that suit the needs for space. You mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. and um, and and so it goes on. And then at a certain point, you see, I started that one by saying, "Look, there's two little shopping centres, one on the bridge, and one not past the, the the new street that was built. That can line it. We go straight on through that site, and we cross it." at a diagonal, as if it was China, going diagonally across the map of China. And you go at the outside, and there is an old medieval town, now with modern, nondescript buildings, but with the old stairway. And there's another little shopping center. I said, we're going to link those two, and that's the main way through our street. And that's what people will use. And then we found a map we'd missed, and believe it or not, exactly where we wanted that street, there had been a street. <laughs> and probably for a thousand years, we mm -hmm. just missed it. And of course, that was the major thing that linked those two little shopping centers a thousand years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was still there. Mm -hmm. And we still use it. Mm. And then we said, on this side, you can have the deputies access. On this side here, the people. And and I said, and I really want a fruit and produce market along the middle, not in honor of Bob and his dad, but because it's all over you know, that and books, bookstores on the outside. And Monsieur the President said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so what do you know what happened? The people who cross underground, they don't have the blue sky over them, but they've put a fruit and produce market there. Oh. Well, that's not too bad, I that suppose. Works. Yes. So you're getting the feeling of my approach and mm -hmm. what happens. And um, I, I, I'm, and you see, and all that time I've been teaching too. I, go, I went on with studios. The last one I did was, um, let me think. I did one called um, the, Archite the Architecture of Wellbeing. Mm -hmm. And it was on the thing of, look at the very beautiful buildings that have um, decorated places for health, like saunas, you see. Mm. And um, what's the, what are the other ones like that? There's Roman baths mm -hmm. and um, uh, the health clinics in Switzerland and all of that. And I said, why is there no modern... Um, representation of the present phase. And I gave them a, a very um, imaginative program. They start on their own and they think of um, designing themselves a sauna for them and five friends. But it can, can be anywhere you like. It can be within a watercolor. It can be in the Chinese Sea. Mm -hmm. It can be on the roof of a of a building which has got these little round. Um, you, know, you see a lot of them in New York. Um, water tanks. Oh. <laughs> you can put them between two water tanks. You see, mm -hmm. and people chose all these things. And I was sick with my back then. That was a time when I needed, I needed, um, uh, you know, surgery, but not any surgery. Um, trip disc surgery. Mm -hmm. So I was in bed and I began to realize the real need for a, a sanatorium when Sonny von Moss invited me and Bob to come and stay with them in their chateau on one of the big canals. Oh, did it help recovery. So that, that stirred it on for me even more. And um, so, so I, I said to them, um, find where you want to put it. And I said, they're young and well, they're going to make this thing a sexual orgy. <laughs> and it was by no means. They made it a, um, a, a pilgrimage toward death. Oh. <laughs> you see, you came to a field and you crossed a field and there was a river and you crossed the river and there was a hill and on the on the hill was a light, and you went right up to the light, and that's where you put your sauna. 
<laughs> <laughs> so the opposite of a sex orgy. <laughs> yes, yes. And they, they had great fun with that. Then once they had done that, I made them do analysis of Cambridge by public and private and big streets and small streets. And I said, now you're going to do some kind of commercial health thing. It could be, it could be a, a municipal one or it could be a commercial one. But now this is a bigger one. Um, and work out, like if it's something for, um, for um, working on um, addiction, you don't want to put it out in the main space. You want to make it where there's no disgrace and go into it. Mm. See what kind of place you do for that. And so some of the others think of a pachinko parlor where they put those in Japan. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I made them analyze cities in terms of how do you use it for that kind of purpose. And um, then the other thing I did to keep us honest, I found an old retired person who'd been teaching in the public health department, a doctor. And he came and joined us. He had a great time. And he said, of course, there's something you've been missing. Churches. And I said, what? He said, well, you know, when you walk into a church, your blood pressure goes down. Uh, <laughs> and then another funny thing that happened. Um, um, I got Bob's good friend, Phil, uh, Phil Finkelpearl, to come as well. And he's a poet and a, a teacher of English. And he was lovely in there, too. And so he, he said, your students are so good. Now he'd got Harvard's best students, but he said, I had better. They're so good. And um, I said, well, why? And then the doctor said, well, I feel they're very much better than my students. But I realize the reason is, if my students were in front of me, they wouldn't then um, make a fool of themselves in front of me as your students do. <laughs> That's what makes them so good. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, I so, want to be conscious yeah. of time here, so I, I do want to talk about yes. the um, the Sainsbury Wing, the National Gallery London, and also yes. it, this part of the conversation ties, of course, into other projects of yours that have well, undergone <laughs> radical changes. Yes. Well, you see, now, there's more than that. I've worked in our office since 1967, and with Bob since 60, and I had done a lot of things in that office. I, I was responsible for all the planning, for the programming. Um, I, I ran it for a long time, the publicity thing. Um, hmm. I was the one who brought in this arts and, this um, National Gallery project. I went and visited them there and told them about my training and all of that. You see, when Bob learned that they were sitting in the planning school, this woman who knew more about mannerism than he did that's when he became a very good friend mm. and that's when we began working together and i i was one of his critics for his his, his father's his mother, his, for for his uh, mother's building hmm. and 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 we'd have dinner together and I, i'd go and get a crit from him and he from me and so on and my he came and gave crits to my students they were very grateful to me for that so there was all that but then People think, oh, she does all those things. She, she's no architect. No, you, know, you wouldn't ask me about architecture. But that's why I don't tell people about them. But I ran that office for 20 years when John Rock left. And mm -hmm. the reason he left was because I want, wanted us to do studios as well. Bob wanted to, but he didn't. And then the other thing was that... Um, he didn't get the National Gallery building. I did. <laughs> and then he, then he found a rich wife, and they left. He built himself a big house, and they left, and he just died. Mm. You, you shouldn't talk about that. I told him I wouldn't talk about it, but he really betrayed me very much and Bob. Mm. And then one day, one of our, our clients, a funny guy from Canada who had been a priest, and he said, I want to tell you two something. He said, I've been doing a lot of, I'm not a priest anymore, but I've been doing a lot of, what's it called, archiepiscopal or something, visiting in, mm -hmm. in prisons. It's the right word, and I'll remember it. But it's, it. So he's the one who, 
He says, I've been visiting these prisoners, and as um, to a man, they have as their theory, the success they bring their father is failure. And he'd heard Bob saying, look, we're just not succeeding, and, you know, and I'm a failure. And John began roaring with laughter, roaring, roaring, laughter. yes, yes, yes. And I'm an assistant failure, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so he said, do you realize what this guy is doing in your office? He's just pulling you all down. Mm. And I'd been thinking that, but not daring to say it. Mm. And then suddenly, um, we were helped to work it out. We, we gave him six months of... Um, Severance? No, six months of separation from us. Okay. Um, what do you call it when you go on? Sa um, uh, sabbatical. Sabbatical. Yeah. Sabbatical. You know, I, these are my, da my daily words. <laughs> 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 but I get them finally. I haven't lost them quite yet. So anyway, he he was offered sabbatical and he took it. And in that time, he met his second wife. He was busy divorcing his first wife while he was doing all of this. And he met his second wife, and she was pretty rich, I would imagine. He built a big house in Chestnut Hill. And we've never heard from him since then. Mm -hmm. He start, He does a lot of painting. Well, he did a lot of painting. Mm -hmm. I think he's pretty good at painting. Mm. But he, he didn't, didn't seem to. And then I had to take over. And I found a good friend. Um, it's probably a bit too much for you, but um, there was a... I had, we had a student working for us, who was the son of a good friend of my dad and the son of my, a business partner of my dad. They were all South Africans, mm. and the, the, the dad and the son had moved to America. And um, Barney was trained as a lawyer, and oh, would he like to be a professor. <laughs> and, and I suddenly realized that I need advice, and I have to now start our business succession, and I did. And I brought in one person who I gathered could afford it and had insights and was the kind of person you think of, clients think of as the head of an architecture firm. Didn't like him much, but he did all those things. And he could speak convincingly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he could be kind to people. He just got quite bitter and angry with me. <laughs> I'm not sure. He, he'd, he'd blow up about me. <laughs> same, same thing. He wants to run the place and there I am. Yeah. So anyway, so I asked them to join me now in, in uh, financial, financial meetings of the office. Mm -hmm. And the other two ran projects very well, and we got on very well, and they also um, understood their work. They're good project managers and all of that, and they could do the arithmetic. And we had also a business person to help us, but she wasn't all that much of a help. And then what happened was that when, when John left, that's what it was, mm -hmm. and um, um, Barney came every three months. And Barney was running a, one of those wealth things where you help people to invest their money. Right. And so he was doing that, and he was coming every three months, and because he could run a little business, he could help us run our little business, and he could talk to people, and they loved it. Because he just loved talking to students. And you hear Barney giving a seminar. He gave a, a seminar to our whole office on, um, what, what do you call it, um, the miracle of compound interest. Oh, wow. <laughs> and what that did was get the whole office to overinvest in their Keo plans to the greatest amount that anyone in Philadelphia ever has. <laughs> <laughs> We're always very, very amused by that. And they, they now the, the two people who were helping me, they left because they didn't want to own it. And they, they went to work as um, people in universities running projects, running architects, in okay. the client role, and they could do it very, very well. I and see. I have about four people of our firm who do that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then um, Dan went to teach and to set up his own firm. That's Barney's son. He was very brilliant, too. And um, and then there's, there's one other. Um, yes, well, you see, 
Dan was left with a few remaining people in the office. It's a very small office now. And Dan took our, um, our person who I taught to do the business development. And he was quite a character in himself. He does his own exhibitions and um, he designs those for himself. But for them, he does a business development work. And um, so that's the firm now with Dav, Dan ahead of it, sort of semi-retired already, mm -hmm. and they're running it very well. But between that, I was doing all those other jobs, um, de dealing with, with, you know, with, with clients and running the management of the right. thing and uh, you know, what are we going to do about this problem, that problem, the other, and um, arguing with most of my work at that time was also campus planning and then big project planning of um, of complexes like a big sciences complex at, at MIT mm -hmm. and um, uh, also um, a lot of the work around the Princeton projects and so on so you and, and then it came to the National Gallery and I I was the one who did the research on that. I began reading all the journals in England. And um, one of the people who was helping the donors wrote something about, well, this, they said we must have an American because of their technical skills. And then they said, um, but we need one who knows about this. And this one would do that, and that one would do this. He wrote a funny article predicting what they, and it said to me, he doesn't know we're doing museums. I'm going to go and tell them. And I went and I sat and talked with two people there um, who were semi high leaders, the, the director and the assistant keeper. And um, they said, this woman really knows us because I went to the AA and I told them about the kind of brick I would like, the kind of heights we would have, mm -hmm. what we would do about the columns and, and all of that. And I said, I, I, he said, well, would you do a traditional building? I said, no. And he said, well, why not? But, well, I don't, we've never done one. But in actual fact, what we did propose was for them traditional enough to make them want us. Right, right. And I'm doing all of this on my own. And, um, and then our, our, our business manager said, congratulations on marvelous cold call. <laughs> but I went and visited you, and he says, I drank tea with them that looked the color of mud, and I said, oh, England again. <laughs> so you you're the one who brought the project in um yes but yes. so uh, from i only understand what's happening from an outsider's perspective obviously but why is it that that project the la jolla museum of contemporary art mm -hmm. and some other previous projects it's it's an odd thing to me that they would undergo such significant remodels given that they are important works of architecture well, you see, some people think they are, and some people think they aren't. If you're talking about Westminster Cathedral, well, it's an important piece of architecture. You'd never go and put plate glass on the stained windows. Mm -hmm. Well, some people think it's good, and some people think it's bad, and we want, we, we, and I, this is the truth, but don't tell anyone. And I've ferreted it out for a lot of people. We developers want to have an example in the category of one, of some building that's been much eroded, so we can then use it as a precedent to go and erode these other ones you have there. We can't take down Westminster Cathedral, that's an exaggeration, without um, people admitting that this is possible to do, you've already done it in the category one building. Mm -hmm. So I think they made our building a category one building so they could do that. I see. I see. Yeah, as a precedent. Yeah. Yes. And, and I've talked to those people, and I've listened to what they've said. And when finally, there's one there I like, but I think he helped, I think he helped formulate that project. Um, when they introduced me to him, um, they said, I said, he went to MIT, and the project director, the one who's running us, said, no, he didn't. And he said, yes, I did. And I had a nice talk with him. We had a nice talk about the fact that I'd recommend they form 
the program he went to and all of that. But I think he's the one who's bright enough to have said, let's find this thing which people are, you know, um, no one would give in to the Royal Gold Medal because of it. But on the other hand, eight people who were um, the presidents of the RIBA wrote a letter of disgust about what they were doing to it, mm -hmm. eight of them. Yeah. And so, but I think it comes from the business community and they, they had a terrible time getting down that housing project by the Smithsons. And I fought that. And it wasn't working very well as a housing project. Mm -hmm. But no one said, let's find a way to use it as something else because it's so beautiful. And that landscape between the two is so beautiful. They just fought and fought and fought till they got rid of it. And they said, now come, let's together, get together, make a, 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 a class one level building at, that they won't keep and have that as a precedent so we can go on finding sites we want where value added can be very well added thank you yeah, right. meaning sites that other people love right 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 I, I but you shouldn't put that because i think we've still got a chance i think what you could help to do is find a way to send a petition all over the world the way they did over the pritzker prize and um get that from people from all over the world sent to England because they really are scared. They didn't think, you see, I was phoned by someone from the, um, f from one of the, uh, one of the institutions there and he wanted some pictures of Bob's mother's house. Mm -hmm. And I told him what was happening and he was amazed. They were keeping it very quiet. And I said, it needs a, a huge rolling blast of, so it did, and the, the gallery got frightened, and then they held back a bit, and they said, well, we'll put in another petition, and they put in another petition. And you see, I, I knew what, um, my son warned me about Annabelle. She's so charming, I said, so, so nice. I gave them a, over a week of my time to do the San Diego Museum, advising them. I had to tell them about about Gill, who's a very famous early modern American architect. They didn't know enough to try to protect the precinct that's right there next to them, mm -hmm. and things like that. And so she says, oh, you're so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then she said, let me know when we can meet again and we can talk some more. Well, I got busy suddenly. And then suddenly that whole building was done. And the, 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 the pergola was taken down and you know everything mm -hmm. and then she says i met with denise many 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 times did you see that on the record <laughs> I, I have seen that in the news <laughs> yes well you see the many 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 she what well, that means the two days she spent with the but she doesn't say that she means it's about the other building and there she talked we had two zo zooms and she didn't talk to me, we all talked to the group. Mm -hmm. And then there were the time when she phoned and I said, well, I agree partly with this. She said, oh, I'm pleased. The call must have lasted five minutes. And I forget what the other one was for. I said, now, what's the time measurement of many? Can you <laughs> give it to me? <laughs> so she she's a big liar. Yeah. And then, <laughs> And then, you know, she really is, and Jimmy was right, he's had that experience. And there's another person also had that experience. Um, but I don't want to, you know, I think we're going to finish our chances. But when, when the developer said, Denise, what should we do? He's a bright guy. What should we do? And I said, fire them both. And he just looked horrified. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, I've run a business an architecture business for 50 years. So then he stopped speaking to me too. Otherwise, he was sending me notes saying, hi, Denise, because he knew I'd been at, I, I was on the board of visitors at MIT when I told them that they should start that thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it gets so complicated. It yeah. gets very complicated. Now, now more about projects. Um, they're to be seen in different places, you know, and a lot that I've written about 
National Gallery. It's all over. Um, I can't send you stuff now, but Emma's been putting together um, writings about things, if that's what you want. Mm. Or you know, if, if you've got a little time and you can take a little time, like I'm now going to spend the whole day tomorrow on this um, uh, um, <laughs> that's not syllable. It's syllabus. It's syllabus. It's the thing we're going to. It's thing we're going to do tomorrow with them, um, and which is it's 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 a, a you know, it's a Zoom, mm -hmm. but it's a big Zoom. Yeah. And as many of the people who wrote about it will be talking, mm. and you could sit and listen to that if you wanted to get in touch with them. Mm. But but the point is, I have to give a lot of my time to that. Then I've got an article that I took said I would write to a deadline. I had to go right on to that. Straight after that, if I'm going to finish my book at all, I have to start then and do it and find a way for it not to break my back. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You're, so are you retiring very, anytime very busy. soon? <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, I retired in 2012. Look at the retirement I have. Yeah. Oh, my and goodness. You, you know that article that was once written silences? Someone took the lives of women authors for whom there were great pauses in their publishing, and they documented them all against their life histories. And it was all about family crises, like the death of Bob, mm -hmm. you see, the birth of Jimmy, or all of those things. Um, we did have arrangements that I could take time off for child rearing, mm -hmm. and um, I did to some extent, but I did everything that was needed of me. And you're still keeping extremely busy <laughs> somehow. Yes. I'm managing to keep this mind bothering me. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. No, what's <laughs> That's wonderful. Impressive. Now, so you have specific questions now. Yes, there is one other danger that the building called Wu Hall at Princeton. Yeah, Gordon. There's someone called Hobson, hmm. and she is funding a huge, huge addition there. And please, not in brick. That's what she seems to be saying. And it's going to sort of engulf Wu Hall, and I don't think its identity is going to remain. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's a, a lot of a lot of architecture, obviously, if you give it enough time, the program has to adapt. Either the program, either the architecture needs to ex, ex, expand to include more program mm -hmm. or it changes program. But um, there are smarter ways to handle that transition rather than it's just limited. blowing it up. In an article I've written called In Defense of the National Gallery. Mm -hmm. At the end, I trace that project, that, that process you're talking about. And I say it happens in different ways, but in ways where the, where the prejudice and the, the bigotry and the um, argumentation, you know, universities where the stakes are so low because no, the, 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 the conflict is so high because the stakes are so low. When, you do, when that's the case, you get what I call scratching, scratching at everything. Angry faculty members are saying, no one listened to me. Therefore, I'm going to put my desk over here where nothing can open. I'm going to take out this. Who wanted that? And mm -hmm. Little by little, they scratch the building to bits. That's, that's the most pernicious way, I'd say. But there can come a point like with the Fairness Library at Penn, people say, wait a moment, this building had an infill floor, it lost this, it lost that. We're going to put it back to the way it was and we're going to make it the architecture library. Mm -hmm. And now it's so much loved that the law students come and study there because it's so much nicer than the law library. <laughs> and I don't think they're going to change that again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's one of the things it's possible to think of. Yeah, yeah. Um, th I just had a, a last couple questions. There's one question um, that I, I wanted to ask you, and it's zooming out a bit. Do you think that postmodernism has a role in architecture today, or how do you think it fits into the, even okay. the future of architecture? Um, I'm a modernist, and I'm a modernist because I started at two years old as a modernist and my love and my heart and all of that. And, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do buildings like that. Hmm. I'm going to take up their principles, which says 
thing, you know, there's one of them which says, um, there's, there's a little corner of heaven for those who believe in, um, in social concern and the arts. Mm. That's one of the principles I like very much. Another one is when a great big thing comes up with you and you have to roll with the punches, find a way to roll gracefully with the punches. Take <laughs> that as a challenge of modernism, you see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But don't go and do what they did. You know, someone said, this is going to look like an airport lounge. And the developer said, well, why shouldn't it? And then he said an amazing thing. He said, your husband worked for Siren and didn't he? So why wouldn't you make it look like an airport lounge? <laughs> and of course, and he referred to the Washington one, which is full of red, looks like <laughs> you know, uh, digestive tubes or something <laughs> in there around there. So, and I've got a picture showing why you wouldn't doing that. Do that. I had a great big black lady wearing a kind of a white outfit like a nurse or something, sitting on one of those benches with hardly room for her and almost no room for her great big bundle that she had next to her. Mm -hmm. And something was making something stupid. She, them, or they, her. Mm, right. And and I didn't say to him, the moment Bob got to, to um, Simon, he said, well, your husband worked for Simon. <laughs> and I said, um, he was sent there by Lou Kahn, so he'd be out of the way. And he resigned almost as soon as he got there. And then um, they persuaded him to stay a little while. And then he stayed a little while, get the building done he was working on. And then he left and went to the American Academy. And then I had a, a go with Saranam, which was even worse. He was disgusting. Oh, really? And I ended up telling him, um, your, your, your father's buildings are a whole lot better than your buildings. <laughs> <laughs> um, my last question, and it's kind of a tricky one to answer. Um, well, it, look, let me just yeah. say one more thing about postmodernism. There's two kinds. And mine is violently the one kind, which is it comes out of the notion of forces and form, but even more so out of the notion of the Holocaust. And that's huh. where many of those social thinkers started from, when they said, after the Holocaust, never again. Now, of course, it's happened over and over. Mm -hmm. but, and they said this was a loss of innocence. And people like Umberto Eco and those others began to write about loss of innocence. We can't just say we can be artists. We have to have some, something, some other realizations as well and include these. And... Um, People like um, Adolf Frank does the same thing. And so that's where I could move from postmodernism. The other postmodernism is of Philip Johnson, and I call that POMO. It's not anything to do with us. Interesting. <laughs> POMO, <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, with the no, last one more question you said yes Just, yes the last question is just a fun one that we like to ask which is and this is sometimes the hardest question that architects uh, have to answer which is what is your favorite building <laughs> <laughs> well i can tell you like i love the building i grew up in yeah um i love bob's mother's house <laughs> yeah. um but i um, for example, there's a, a building in um, England called the Dal Dallas Hill Synagogue. And it's by an engineer, and it's all concrete. And I sat in that synagogue, and I heard the rabbi say, we have to cover the walls of the synagogue, or people will say our congregation has hearts as hard and cold as its concrete walls. Mm -hmm. You go and look at the whole thing, and it's not only... It's, it's, exquisite, but the place where Lou Kahn stole the elevation for the work he did in India. There it is. <laughs> really? Lou Kahn was a great thief. <laughs> 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 so there are buildings like that you just say, oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And um, I, again, I've, I've been through many palazzos in Venice that I just love. 
Mm-hmm. And um, you know, like also La Compasita, is it called? It's the one in uh, on the uh, Brenta Canal. And you could see they keep cows in the ground floor. And it's got a cow, a, a, a trough there to drink. Very elegant. And also it's got, um, I think, the cabbages grow on the outside. And I think they store cabbages. And every grand palace stored the goods that its merchants sold. And they went from the back of the palace, not the front, in a... In a it's called a sandolo, not a van, not a, no. See, I can't, I can remember one now, not the other. <laughs> sandolo is the flat bottomed one, the um, something or other, mm-hmm. um, which you know even better, is the one that has a serotonin, uh, has a, 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 it has a, a, a a landing at the front and is very decorated. And this, the, well, I definitely don't know the word. <laughs> no, you do know the word. You see, I know the word. Um, it's uh, anyway. Look, it's the thing you get off of. Uh, you get on onto the land from from the canal if you are a nobleman, and a few others of us by paying a lot of money. Uh, There's a little uh, little one that's called a Traghetto, and you, you oh, just stand on that. Evaporator. But the other one, the evaporator, the evaporator. No, no, it's not. It's not. Actually, all, it's, it's how I get. No, it's the one. It's the gondola. The gondola. You know, better than the other. Yes, and the gondoliera, gondoliere, grows it for you. And so, so the point was that um, I'd studied all that, and I'd studied the insides of them, and how that big internal thing was a mixture of grand scale and and you could do construction from there and things like that and, and both of those and then it went beautifully into the scale of the, the, the building above it and mm-hmm. also on onto the scale of the um the bridge of size and that's the scale we made in our building to go up those stairs and then from the Italian part to the larger scale rest of it. Mm. And they're carefully studied and carefully occupied, and they don't even know that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yes. Okay, that's the last. That's the last. <laughs> we made it through. Um, yes, Denise... you're going to write a 200-page book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the equivalent of a 200-page book for sure. Uh, Denise, this was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for taking... Uh, the two and a half hours to speak with us. This was a lot of fun. The stories were phenomenal. Mm. Um, I know you're missing a few well, nouns, I, but I your memory is still very short. Out, you know, yeah. I needed to come out because I may not finish my book now. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm sure you will. Just you got to get exercising, keep doing your, your dancing on the balcony, yes. and you'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and, and you've been very sweet, and it's been fun. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 213-222-6950. You can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.